last week. So it says um, session one, overview PPE. And so what I'm going to do is in future, I will start with this first and then also end with this. But I'm, I'm showing this to you guys now because it's in line with your curriculum. So let's just move this picture of myself here and this bar across, go back. All right, so this is uh, the neater version of the diagram that I drew for you guys last week. It has uh, all seven of the stages and I'll make this particular diagram um, available for you to have a look at. Um, on the on the row um, or the, the list of little circles going down, it says high school all the way through to constructing a building. And that's really all the stages that SACAP is going to be testing you on in the professional practice exam. What I've done is I've listed on the left hand side all of the topics that are made or that are presented inside SACAP syllabus. Now the syllabus slightly changes over the month. It's not a very big change, but there is a change. So um, if you are um, looking at last year's papers, there might be some things that came out that you might not have this year. So let's look at what they are looking for at this year. The last time we spoke, we all had an opportunity to, to list these uh, topics on the left-hand side uh, according to the steps. Let's see how much we know so far very quickly. So uh, at number one, high school apply to study. Uh, I guess we far beyond that point now. Um, the second stage where it says enroll at an ALS. ALS stands for accredited learning site. Um, and you would know that based on our prior discussion, but let's look on the left-hand side what the topics are. So it says accredited learning site, and you should know an accredited learning site is a place that you can study at according to SACAP. Um, SACAP is the South African Council for the Architectural Profession, SACAP. And the program at the School of Architecture you're studying needs to be validated. So the program needs to be checked by SACAP that what you are offering is is correct. SACAP will then come to visit your site to inspect it and see if it can be an accredited learning site, a place where you can study. Um, after you studied at the site, you will graduate. That's number three on the block. And it says there you're a graduate and you are graduating um, and you need to register as a candidate. Remember, everyone who graduates, graduates as a candidate, whatever they are. So on the left hand side, you have the categories of designation, draft person, technologist, senior technologist, architect. The word that's going in front for every single one of them when you finish graduate is candidate. So it's a candidate draft person, candidate technologist, candidate senior, candidate architect. Um, and only once you finish right the professional practice exam can you get the designation of professional. Um, you see this, the, the topic there is identification of works policy and mentorship. Identification of works policy is a policy we have discussed and you do need to ensure that you have a look at it and understand what it refers to. Um, and what the, the complexity of work is for each of those different designations, task person, technologist, senior, architect. And then mentorship. It's quite important that you have a mentor to guide you along this process. It's not necessarily an easy process, and it's not like you were born knowing this information. Someone has to have come before you, experience all of these problems, and then share it with you. So that's at uh, getting a mentor uh, when you graduate. Then commencing training. So once you've gotten this mentor, you can now commence your training. Co training cannot commence without a mentor. Generally, the mentor should be a, a person that is at a higher level than you, uh, as in one designation higher. If you're a draft person, you should have a technologist training you or a professional technologist training you. So in commencing training, it says in training and candidacy. You are not doing your candidacy or in training. The provision of architectural services. You're now going to learn how to provide all those architectural services, the different types of architectural services. What can you do? Um, you can do stages. You learn about SACAP stages, one to six. And where in the stages do you fit in? And you would know from between one and four, it's more or less um, design work and, and documentation. And then moving on from four to, to six, it's more construction. Um, then he talks about monthly training records. Remember your monthly training records, what you needed to fill in. It allows SACAP to see whether you have done enough work to meet the competencies and whether you've done enough work to be able to submit um, your records um, to SACAP to say that I have gained my hours and I now have enough hours to write the provision process exam. Um, it, then to, uh, it, there, it does mention competencies that you need to meet and you have to have so many hours in a particular competency, whether that's working drawings or design work or whatever the case is. Then it moves on to partial services. Now, partial services, additional services, talks about the scope and what the architect is actually able to do and what he, what, what he or she is offering, uh, or they is offering. Um, ethics in the provision of architectural services. So ethics and how do you respond as a professional to certain situations? Um, how do you price things? How do you treat clients? All of these um, 
notions need to be experienced when you're working in practice. And under a mentor, you'll be able to experience this and hopefully they'll give you good advice towards dealing with clients and contractors and how to be an ethical professional. Then limited dispensation um, is one of the topics that SACAP has been mentioning quite often recently in this year, 2021, 2022. So make sure you look at that and see when does limited special dispensation apply. Now looking at point number five, writing the PPA exam. As soon as you write and you see it says relevance through lifelong learning, SACAP is trying to ensure that once you now have finished and you are a professional, you technically don't necessarily need to uh, train yourself any further in the educational um, realm because you're a professional and you can practice and continue making money uh, on your own. However, to ensure that you don't become irrelevant, there's a few things that are in place to ensure that. And so the voluntary association, which is on the left-hand side stated now, are the ones that um, a SAC app in providing information that will keep the architectural professional relevant. And how will they do that? They will do that through providing um, continuous professional development courses, CPD courses. Now there's different categories of CPD points, category one, two, and three. There's individual, there's development, um, and, and, and so on. You need to know the three different types of them. Uh, and well, it's just three, it's individual development and work-based. Um, there's associated legislation with that. Understand uh, the legal frameworks around this and um, what is the purpose of a voluntary association and um, how does it relate to you? Um, and then it says registering as a professional um, after you write the PPE exam and you receive a pass on it, which we all are hoping for, you will get um, a, you will first get a certificate to say, here's your um, marks for the exam. And if you have already met all of your hours, um, then you will be allowed to apply for an upgrade uh, to the title of professional. And as you might or may or may not have seen that SACAP had a workshop on Privy Seal. And that's why Privy Seal is mentioned in one of these topics. Privy Seal is, a, is, a, is, a, is an email signature that you will get that will have the date and timestamp and a QR code to verify uh, whether you are actually a practicing professional. You put this at the bottom of your emails when you're sending emails out. Every practice, registered practicing professional needs to have this Privy Seal. So once you have passed the exam, you send a message to SACAP, you want to upgrade, you pay the fee, and then they will give you a Privy Seal um, email um, signature. So next, now that you've written a PPE exam, you're like, great, I have things also in my life, I'm leaving my firm, starting my own one, or I'm going to become a partner in my firm, I need to understand how this is going to work, or you're going to, to start a startup with another group of friends, uh, just say you've freshly graduated or whatever the case is, uh, and you have a little bit of work experience. So then you want to open a practice, you need to acquire work and you need to go through the processes of acquiring work. Tenders are one of those processes that you could use to acquire work. And once you have acquired work, you definitely need staff to be able to complete those tasks, to give direction to. And so if you have a look on the left-hand side, it says the architectural professional as practitioner. You are not practicing architecture because you're a professional. And then it says the architectural professional and their office, you now need to set up an office and a system that's working of the secretary and um, workers and senior and managers and uh, senior managers and uh, financial managers and all the processes that need to keep this firm running. Um, it's, it's quite simple to think about because once you get a, a project, you need to invoice the client and how you do that, well, you might have to do it yourself. If you have a secretary, you'd have a, an accounts department that would do it for you. And then the money needs to come in, you need to start the work and you need to make sure there's regular payments. And once you start the work, you need someone to work for you and a couple of people doing work and then you give direction to them. And then once it happens, you also need to start constructing the project. So you need to get a team who's going to construct it. It's quite a logical processes to follow. And that's what your, your office would be made up of. Um, then he says establishing a practice. Understand that once you um, have started or you at least have this concept in your mind, I want to open a practice, you need to go through the following or, or the, sorry, the necessary legal steps to open up a business. You need to register it. You need to ensure that um, the CIPC, um, you, you, uh, you know, are aware of the processes regarding the CIPC. Uh, it's relatively cheap to register a company or a business. It's about 250, 280 rand, somewhere around there, to have the name given and to get your VAT number and all of the related legal framework around that. Make sure you read up on that and, and you know what that's about uh, in establishing a practice. And you need to do this and inform, once you uh, officially registered your company with your practice, you need to inform SACAP of this within 30 days of doing so. Um, it then also mentions uh, uh, here, after establishing a practice is the personnel. You need to ensure that the people who are, who are going to be the, the the partners or the associates or the people working at the company, their letterheads need to be at the, oh sorry, their names need to be at the bottom of the letterheads 
company official letterheads, what their qualifications are, where they studied, all that very valuable information to show your credibility and authenticity. Um, it then goes on to financial management, which I mentioned, risk management, you need to, to be able to foresee problems that are going to happen in the project and try to uh, manage that, mitigate its, its, its problems, uh, mitigate meaning to listen, to make it less bad. Um, quality management systems, you need to be able to put in place management systems like, for example, and these are quite practical examples, you know, if you have a new intern at your, uh, at your firm, they probably might not know how to dimension properly or to detail properly or to write um, a revisions block properly or to fill out um, the notes block properly. So you need to have specific processes in place and specific steps in your office so that it goes through a quality management process so that before it goes out to a contractor or to a client, all these things are checked. So that's, um, that, that's part of quality management systems, as well as in the construction phase. Um, like we were just discussing just now, you, you need to definitely ensure that you speak to the builder, to the contractors, so that they understand very well what's going on. And there must be some sort of formal communication whenever you issue an instruction. Um, project planning, delivery and controls falls under the same line. Make sure that you plan the projects well when you're doing the Gantt charts and ensuring that this must occur on that day and what happens if it doesn't and what's the next phase, there has to be planning of this. And you are typically the one that's going to be planning those. So you need to have thought about all these things when you open a practice. I'll summarize it for you. First, you need to think about how you're going to get work acquired through tenders or through um, say you are referrals or you're getting referrals or say perhaps you're advertising, whatever the case is, find out how you're going to get work. And once you get work, you need to know how is that work going to flow into the system to generate money and keep generating a profit or at least money to keep the company going until you can generate a profit. And if you're doing that, sometimes or most of the time, you need people to assist you with that, not just with the work, but people who are associates and partners to help you with acquiring work and managing these processes and a professional team like engineers and quantity surveyors who can help you com complete these projects. Um, and then you need to ensure that there's always quality um, that's assured in all the projects. So you need to have processes in place. Um, so that's an opening a practice, but now let's say after you open practice, you, you've got everything going all together. You now get into the realm of constructing buildings. Apart from planning and designing, construction of buildings is the next um, major step for us. And I think it's perhaps the end goal of everybody to see something that they designed or worked on that is now becoming a real building. And so it talks firstly there about property law. Um, the law which governs ownership of property and what types of properties do you get? Do you get a sectional title deed where you own a portion or something? Do you have an entire title deed, just a title deed that allows you to own the entire piece of land? Um, is it um, a, a shared scheme um, where, 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 or block share where you own a portion of the entire thing and everybody owns shares uh, in it? Um, there's, there's, a, there's lots of different ways to look at property law. Uh, and so I'm just very basically skimming over it to give you um, an overview of the kind of questions you could be asked on it. And the law of delict, something we had discussed before, and we said the law of delict as in by default, what is your responsibility? The concept of lien, or uh, another way of looking at it is a retention of rights. Uh, who does the rights belong to? Remember we spoke about the idea of lien and we said alien uh, and the idea that uh, the contract is almost like an alien that you're giving the site to and he, he retains the rights over the site, it belongs to him uh, as long as um, you are doing the construction project or as long as it's commencing. So you need to have a wave of lien. Uh, then there's also Latin phrases like de minimis, meaning so small it's negligible that you need to take into consideration. The law of agency, giving someone um, power to act on behalf of you. Dispute resolution, that's arbitration, litigation, mediation, those three. Uh, construction, procurement and contracting. How do you go out to tender? Um, what is the process of tendering? Do you tender with a bill of quantities, a bill of materials? Um, do you, should you have a full set of working drawings when you go out to tender? Um, then it has a cloak of works and in the context of principal agency and principal consultancy, uh, you, you'd have a, an understanding of, of principal agency and those ideas. Um, and clerk of works administering um, contracts. Joint ventures and consortiums is who you're working with together in a team. Are you working in a joint venture um, with uh, another party or a consortium, a consort like a group, like assortments, a group of people together? Um, who is the professional team? Is it only made up of you and the engineers or you engineers, quantity surveyors, mechanical engineer, engineers, and then construction pricing strategies. How are you going to cost this project? Is it going to be a lump sum project? Uh, is it going to be a cost plus contract? Is it going to be um, uh, um, a turnkey operation? 
How are you costing this entire project? And this is just mainly to do with construction. We're not talking about the documentation process and the planning and designing. We're mainly talking about construction here. And as you'd know, in the industry, most of the money lies in construction. So it's quite an important thing to think about. Now, these are the topics that have been discussed for the May 2022 exam. Um, this is most of them uh, in their larger headings and larger categories. If you go and look at the syllabus, you'll find more subheadings below that. But these are the large categories under which um, information is categorized. And so for today, what we're going to be talking about is looking at number seven uh, in constructing a building. We're going to be looking at the process of once the tender is received or has been awarded, what happens after that? What's defects and what's liability and how does the process work? So I'm gonna stop sharing the screen. I'm going to open